style four. On one hand, we're zoomed all the way out here. We're thinking about something that affects the paper as a whole, the document itself at the highest level. But we're also thinking about something that's very micro, that goes down to the level of word choice and sentences and paragraphs. We're talking about tone. How can you sound professional without sounding like a college student trying to sound smart? How can you sound savvy like you belong at the table without sounding too casual, irresponsible? What we're going for is business casual a lot of the time. And this is a matter of tone, for instance. Here is a writer, a student, who has interviewed a doctor and is reporting on that information. Now, Dr. Chen, you'll notice, Dr. Pauline Chen is speaking in very plain English. That's legitimate. She's doing it for a reason. She's trying to cut through a lot of noise and really convey a day in the life of a doctor to people who are thinking about going into medicine. So anybody in health sciences, this should sound pretty familiar. Problem is, the student who's interviewing Dr. Chen keeps throwing in these weird word choices. Let's have a look. After being, quote, stuck, cut, coughed on, scratched, and splashed on when treating patients, Dr. Pauline Chen reveals that she, quote, feels the floor fall away each and every time in sheer terror of the consequences. All doctors surely feel this same fear, wondering when their luck will run out and a deadly disease transmission will seal their fate. However, Dr. Chen always comes to the same conclusion. She, quote, consented to an unspoken contract with the public to take care of patients no matter how awful the risk because, above all, it's a privilege, a calling to take care of patients. Okay? So a little repetitive and weirdly dramatic. When you've got really good evidence, trust the really good evidence and try to get out of the way. Don't do this. Each and every might be great if you're running for office and you need a nice repetitive phrase to strike the podium with, but it doesn't belong here in professional writing, sheer terror, a revelation, luck will run out, a deadly disease, seal their fate, awful. No, no, it's unnecessary, and it's like an audio pop. It just doesn't belong here. So think about how you might rework that paragraph. We'll look at a couple of other kinds of examples, and then we'll come back to Dr. Chen before we go. Tone is a matter of choice, and there is often a reason to go for a particular kind of tone instead of another. These are all correct for certain audiences, but they're wrong for other audiences. For instance, number one, grilled lohi finished with orange gastric, garrosha, and niçoise. Who talks like that? Where would you be likely to see it? Maybe a menu? And why? Why? Why do we use these rather strange kinds of terms on this particular kind of menu? Well, it's a business model, right? We're probably charging a lot for this, whatever it is, and we want it to sound like we've scoured the world for the very best ingredients. We want it to sound exotic. We also want you to tip your waiter. Right? This is on a menu in a restaurant, and you're going to have to hire an interpreter to explain this to have some idea of what you're actually getting for dinner. So you'll, you'll have to pay the person to translate it. Grilled lohi finished with orange gastrique, garrosha, and niçoise. This is talking down, right? This is written from a position of expertise by someone who wants to use words you do not know. No problem with that on that menu. It fits perfectly. It works. It does its job but it wouldn't work on maybe a cooking show. So we'll look at a, a way to redo this in a minute. Number two, an appreciation of the effects of calcium blockers can best be attained by an understanding of the activation of muscle groups. Absolutely. 
perfect, great. If you're talking to other nurses who already know all this, if you're talking to other people in healthcare, other people who've taken those same classes, and you don't need to go back over a lot of background information. Now, if you're trying to explain this to a student, would this be the best way to teach it? Hmm, not so sure. Number three, some numbers and letters. What can they possibly mean? Probably the stats for somebody's inner athlete. And number four, makers of texts know that readers need external semiotic cues. Okay, that's great for them. Maybe something that we'd see in a literary journal or something like that, but so abstract, so technical, that it's kind of hard to understand. Once you've got your salmon off the grill and plated, throw on the orange sauce and some crumbly cheese. Our go-to cheese is garrocha, a sheep's milk concoction from Spain. Top it off with a few sliced olives. If you're looking for some out-of-the-ordinary olives, try Nisoise. There's the cooking show. There's the cookbook written in a different tone because you actually want people to understand it. The menu is written not to be understood. 1B is written for the general public. More plain English style in 2B. Our muscles work by contracting, and the contraction of muscle depends on calcium. Nice emphasis there. If we can understand how calcium activates our muscle groups to make them contract, then we can appreciate how those muscle groups are affected by the drugs called calcium blockers. Notice here they told us what calcium blockers are. They didn't just expect us to know that that's a kind of drug. Nice to know. They gave us a category. If you give someone a category, it helps them understand any technical terms that you want to use. Let me repeat that. If you give someone a category, it helps them understand any technical terms you want to use. For example, let me tell you about some olives called niçoise. Olives is the category. Niçoise is the technical term. Let me tell you about a cheese called garrocha. Cheese is the category. Garrocha is the technical term. Let me tell you about a drug class called calcium blockers. Drugs is the category. Calcium blockers is the technical term. I'm going to tell you about a baseball player. And now I can throw out all the technical terms I want, and you'll understand that they have something to do with baseball. Makers of texts, big general term that includes so much it's hard for me to understand it, so I should make some particular examples available to people. Authors, editors, publishers, and illustrators create a book. A book is a particular kind of text, and those are some of the humans who help make it. So that's easier to understand for B for that particular reason. So when we're trying to reach a general audience, go for that Goldilocks zone not really zoomed out and abstract like makers of texts, not super specific like Garosha. But why use technical terms at all? What are they for? I want to suggest to you that technical terms can lend your writing an air of authority, but they backfire when you use them just to try to sound smart. They exist to allow professionals to convey that complex or precise information swiftly. But because even your own colleagues may not know or care about your pet project, make sure that even when you're talking to biochemists about a poison, you anchor your technical terms with more general category words. So for example, if you say, let me tell you a story about some herbs, you can rattle off all the Latin names you want, and I'll stay with you. You can say Stefania Tetrandra, you can say Aristolochia, and I'm not lost because I know, okay, we're still in the middle of an herb story. No problem. Great. So if you want practice, you can go back to the Pauline Chen slide with all those weird dramatic words thrown in, like seal your fate, and try doing it yourself. And in the next slide, I'll give you my version. Even after being stuck, cut, coughed on, scratched, and splashed on when treating patients, Dr. Pauline Chen still feels the floor fall away every time she thinks about those incidents' potential consequences. All doctors face similar situations. 
knowing that a patient may transmit a disease. Plain English, right? A patient may transmit, all doctors face, but notice the dramatic language is gone. Dr. Chen views it this way. She consented to an unspoken contract with the public to take care of patients no matter the risk. In fact, it's a privilege, a calling. Here, the writer did a great job of shutting up. The writer got out of the way and put all of the emphasis on the excellent breakdown of the information by Dr. Pauline Chen. We can do that. Take out any technical terms that are just there to sound smart. If you don't need any, don't have any. Use them as needed to convey that complex or precise information, but even then, consider anchoring them quickly by giving them, by giving the reader a more general term first for context. That nice category word, that basket, herbs, and then you can throw anything you want in that basket. Take out that dramatic language, unless it's an exact quote for some reason. Really rely on your quotations. Rely on your data. Rely on your evidence. Trust it. Tell us what it adds up to, and then stop. Thanks.